This is Health Yeah, your weekly update on what's going on in the health, wellness, and medical world with Monica Robbins. Hey everyone, welcome to Health Yeah, your prescription for clear, concise medical health and wellness information. I'm Monica Robbins. University Hospitals Cleveland announced it is closing two of its suburban hospitals, the inpatient beds and emergency departments in both Richmond and Bedford. The reason may surprise you, not necessarily because the facilities are hemorrhaging money, but because they simply don't have the staff to operate them. I interviewed Dr. Paul Hinchy to explain why they made this decision, what happens to those remaining employees, and what happens to the neighborhood around them. So Dr. Hinchy, tell me why University Hospitals is doing this. So even before COVID, there was a significant shortage of healthcare workers, particularly nurses, uh, across the country. It was uh, projected that by 2026, we would have a significant shortage of nurses with a significant number of nurses uh, being over the age of 50. So roughly 50% of the nursing population uh, back in 2018 was over 50 years of age and almost 30% was over 60 years of age. So our nursing population was getting closer and closer to retirement age. When COVID hit, we exacerbated or accelerated the nursing crisis as many nurses left the healthcare field, um, either to retire or to pursue other interests. That has continued all through COVID um, and during COVID, UH, in order to continue to care for our patients, had to continuously look at how we were delivering care, what was needed in the community, what was needed in our hospitals, and adjust based on our ongoing staffing challenges. Uh, We continue to have significant nursing challenges. Uh, They are particularly acute or severe in the areas that uh, are in the hospital, so services we provide in our hospital settings and in the emergency department. That has reached a point for us where we are going to move our services from our inpatient services and our emergency department services from Richmond and Bedford to our nearby hospitals at uh, Lake West and Ahuja. What impact do you think this will have on the communities around Richmond and Bedford? So fortunately, we have nearby hospitals that can continue to provide those emergency and inpatient services. Those are actually only a small part of what any health system does, the hospital and emergency component. A very important part of what we do is be in the community for uh, detecting and surveilling for disease, identifying disease through our primary care practices, and then referring those patients to our specialists in the same community so that we can treat diseases, conditions early on when they're more treatable and hopefully avoid the need for hospitalization and the emergency department. Because of that, UH will not be moving any of its services related to that primary care function or our specialty practices. All our physicians and their clinics will remain where they exist in our current medical office buildings in those communities. What about behavioral health? Will that remain as well? So our behavioral health unit uh, is a, is a, Cleveland Medical Center Behavioral Health Unit. It's one of several behavioral health units that we have across the UH system. That is currently located at Richmond. It serves the entire UH system, um, and it will continue to function and operate at the Richmond location. How many inpatient beds do these hospitals have, and how much of an impact will closing them be? Historically, um, we had close to 50 beds in each of those, 50 to 60 beds in each of the facilities. Back in October, as we were in the peak of a COVID crisis and we were facing significant staffing challenges, we actually reduced the number of beds at each of those facilities down to 14 and moved our staff to help uh, manage our high level patient volume that we're seeing in in some of our other larger medical centers. So they've been operating at roughly 14 beds since last October. How many employees is this going to impact and the breakdown of what types of employees? There are roughly 600 employees across both locations that will be impacted. A significant number of them will remain in those locations working in their 
physician practices supporting those practices, or the doctor's offices that are there now. Um, the remainder will be moved to other sites. They All of our employees will be given the, the option to choose where they'd like to go to. Hopefully, they'll be able to move closer to their home, uh, closer to their colleagues that they used to work with. Uh, fortunately, we, or unfortunately, we have so many vacancies within the UH system that we have opportunities in nearly every role and at nearly every hospital in the system. How severe is this staffing shortage currently? So I, I think it's uh, it's safe to say it is severe. Um, with COVID and the intense amount of work and, and the huge sacrifices that our teams have made to continue to safely care for our communities, uh, we have seen an acceleration of folks leaving healthcare. It was uh, estimated that in 2022, we'll lose an additional 500,000 nurses across the United States, and that will result in a deficit of roughly 1.1, 1.2 million nursing positions across the country. Is this historically the most, uh, the most severe staffing shortage UH has experienced? Uh, by far in, in memory of those still at UH, uh, this is by far our most significant staffing shortage. We have over 3,000 vacancies in the system currently. Roughly 900 of those are in nursing roles. Uh, it varies a bit like by location with our in-hospital and emergency OR and ICU nurses being in shorter supply. Um, we have some more resources in our uh, clinical practices in the communities. What about non-essential employees? Will any of those people face layoffs? Nobody will be facing layoffs. Uh, we have, again, roles literally for every position, uh, nearly at every site across the system. So there is plenty of opportunity uh, for people to uh, find new work at a new location of their choosing. We've seen emergency rooms close in the past in other communities, and that's typically a, a very uh, sticking point for a lot of neighborhoods. So how busy were these emergency rooms, and is there any chance you could perhaps keep an urgent care there or some other facility nearby, or is it realistic that getting to another nearby hospital is the way to go? So these are some of our lowest utilized facilities um, in our emergency departments. And we're very fortunate that unlike some communities where that is the only emergency care available, our Ahuja and Lake West sites are only about six miles from Bedford and Richmond, respectively. So those actually remain close to the communities so we can continue to provide those services at those locations. You know, a lot of people are going to to say, you know, every hospital across the nation received a lot of money from the government relating to COVID. Um, you know, why is it that you would have to close when you receive so much money because of the pandemic? Does that have any play into why this decision was made? This isn't a decision about dollars. It, it is truly a decision about staffing. We continue to try and recruit from across the country. Uh, we recruit locally, uh, nationally, even internationally. We have pay incentives to encourage folks to continue to work, work overtime, remain with the system. We employ what are called agency nurses or traveling nurses from across the country at much higher rates uh, to make sure we can safely staff all of our care sites. So this isn't about the money. This is purely about there just isn't enough staff for us to service all of our sites the same way we have historically. So we've been, we've needed to look at how we're doing care and start to do it differently and focus on different things based on the needs of the communities. And isn't hospital care actually moving more toward home care? So that's a great question. That is a national trend in healthcare to follow more of a wellness model and to try and be proactive about identifying disease early and treating it early because that's when people respond best, diseases respond best to management. By the time people become inpatients or have to go to the emergency department, we've missed an opportunity to keep them well. So our shift is as a healthcare system and, and across the country to really move to more of a wellness model and we intend to invest in the communities to move in that direction and provide more wellness care versus illness care.
So are these places going to become community wellness centers and, and what impact will local officials have on making these decisions? So we will always engage with our communities and our community leaders to identify what the best needs are for those communities. We certainly do our own research into what diseases are prevalent in the community, how we could potentially intervene earlier uh, in managing and detecting illness, um, but we'll always communicate with the communities to get a sense of what it is they feel they need. Both sites will have, uh, we will implement our wellness centers to provide services, again, focused around keeping the community healthy. They'll focus on things like education around illness, screening for illness. We'll have women and children's programs to help support uh, health in those populations. We're also looking at using uh, food as a medicine or food as a treatment, educating, uh, providing access to healthy foods, but also educating about if you have a disease or an illness, how the right food can help you better manage that illness and lead a healthier life. And then the last part is we'll also be investing in the workforce. Um, we are trying to reach out and given this is a staffing problem, we're trying to find and engage folks to come to healthcare uh, and work with us in the healthcare space. All right. Anything else you want to add? Any final thoughts? So I think it's crucial to understand that we are not leaving these communities. We're simply moving some of the services in, in the form of our emergency department care and our inpatient care to hospitals that we are fortunate to have nearby. So we're not moving, we're not eliminating those services. Um, the important piece is all of our doctors will still be there. Patients will still be able to access the doctors the same way they did before. There'll be the same faces in the same places. Um, none of our employees are going to lose their jobs. We are, every single one of them is critical to the system. There are literally hundreds of jobs that we need to fill uh, across the system and everyone will have a home and they'll be given choices to where that where they go. And I think the last piece is um, we need more folks to engage in healthcare. It's an incredibly rewarding career. Uh, there's something special about uh, serving in a role that has purpose every day and serving your community. And there are hundreds and hundreds of jobs in healthcare that don't require a license, uh, don't require extensive training, but are still extremely helpful in caring for the patients in our communities and we need people to come to healthcare. So if there's an interest, we, uh, we have plenty of openings at UH and we would welcome uh, people coming to UH. Dr. Henchy, thank you so much for your time and your explanation, truly appreciate it. Thank you. Please find me on Twitter and Instagram at Monica Robbins. Like and follow my Facebook page, Monica Robbins WKYC. Subscribe and find video podcasts on my YouTube channel, Monica Robbins. Until next time, have a healthy week. Thanks for listening to Health Yeah! with Monica Robbins from WKYC Studios. Subscribe now so you never miss an update. And find more on everything you heard here on WKYC.com and on the WKYC app.